Come on, anybody here grateful for God? Can you just clap your hands at home, type any emoji wherever you are for all that the Lord has done? God, we are so grateful. Come on, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are a prayer answering God and that you are a covenant keeping God. Thank you for the opportunity to gather, to grow, to dwell, to worship in your presence. God, we are grateful people. So thank you for every tear. Thank you for the pain. Thank you for everything. It wasn't, didn't feel good, but we know it was meant for our good. So I pray now, God, that you would speak life to us, that we would live and not die. Pray, God, that when we leave worship today from our homes, from our cars, from our various places, that we would leave better than how we arrived. Heal and deliver today. Save for your namesake. Speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, turn with me to Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Good to see all of you in worship. I uh, can't wait to read your comments. Can't wait till we are all gathered in the room together. In the meantime, we will be faithful where we are being planted. Amen. That's a good word for somebody. Faithful where if some of us want to quickly move and God is saying, no, show some fruit where you are. And so we're, you know, one of the things that I'm grateful for for the journey, this is our fourth location. We started 820 Nashville Road, fruit. And then we went to the high school, fruit. Y'all should be typing it in. Um, and then we went to our temporary sanctuary, fruit. Then we went online fruit and then we're going to be in our big sanctuary and I'm already decreeing there's going to be fruit there too amen amen Joshua chapter 2 beginning at verse number 1 we find these words recorded and Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies saying go view the land especially Jericho they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. It was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof, hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. The gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Verse 8. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof, said to them, said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. Say amen if you can. Find somewhere where you can take notes and Begin to jot down a few things. This is sermon two in our series called Hidden Figures. And today I want to tag this text and preach from the subject, 
from shame to fame. From shame to fame. In a very real way, this series that we have embarked upon as a congregation is about a re-examination of the lives of the women in the genealogy of Jesus. I'm submitting to all of us as we unpack these sermons that oftentimes we can misalign, oftentimes we can improperly interpret, sometimes people need a re-examination. In other words, sometimes I'm no longer what I did wrong. Sometimes I'm no longer my past. But if all you know about me is my mess up, if all you know about me is the thing that I got wrong, then perhaps this might be a good season for you to give me a fresh look, for you to give me a re-examination so that you know that this is important as it relates to the life of Christianity. Uh, we are not new to the concept of re-examination. The Reformation of the Protestant Church was probably the biggest re-examination of biblical interpretation in history. Protestant Christians would affirm that a re-examination of the kind that Luther partook upon in 1517 was necessary for our good. Because of Luther's re-examination, we have a greater appreciation for salvation by faith alone, solo fide, by sal salvation, solo faith only. Similarly, with this sermon series, Hidden Figures, we are re-examining some lives. Before I even unpack this today, I want to encourage each of us to perhaps begin re-examining our own lives. Y'all, it's probably a good time for us to take a fresh look in the mirror at ourselves. And let me give you some things that we ought re-examine. I think that this might be a good time for, re for us to re-examine our goals. Maybe a good time for us to re-examine how we spend our time. This may be a good opportunity for us to re-examine our friends. Or as my grandmama would say, darling, there are lots of candidates for friendship, but very few friends. A time to re-examine our careers. Even a time to re-examine, don't be offended by this, our physical appearance and our eating habits. I was reading a New York Times article this past week that suggested that people who exercise regularly and who have a good diet are less likely to be hospitalized or to die from COVID. And maybe this is just a good opportunity for us to re-examine the people in our lives. Joshua is a book of victory. Joshua is a book of freedom. It tells us about God's plan for us to live an abundant life. It teaches us how we can have victory in the midst of problems. It teaches us, this is going to be helpful if y'all hang in there, how to drive out the enemy. It teaches us how to overcome the obstacles in our lives. The principal character in our story today is a prostitute by the name of Rahab. Rahab is a personality, a person who has got to overcome many obstacles in her life. She is living apart from God. She is living in a pagan city. Rahab is living in the one of the most wicked cities that has ever existed. And yet God blesses her to be able to overcome it. I want to park here and just say that parenthetically to somebody. God has already blessed some people to overcome more than you'll ever have to deal with. And if God can bless people like Rahab to overcome, then don't you know that he has the blessings upon your life in order for you to overcome anything that you are also facing. This chapter gives us insight on Rahab, who is currently in rehab. It gives us an insight on a prostitute who makes it to paradise. And before we dare judge the lifestyle 
of Rahab too harshly. I want to remind you that there's some Rahabs in us. And you're saying, no, that's a lie. That's why I check out and close my Bible, Pastor. How dare you? I have never had to sell my body. I've never had to do the horrific, shameful acts that Rahab. And no, 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 you're the one lying. Let me help you understand. All of us have a Rahab in us, Pastor. Help me see my Rahab. Let me tell you what Rahab represents, because you have some people in the Bible that are bad to the bone. They are bad for life. They never change. But then you have some folk in the Bible that are just bad for a season. See, if you've ever been bad for a season, then you have a Rahab in you. Is there anybody listening to me, priest, that can look back over your life and say, there was a season I was outside of the will of God. That was the Rahab. There was a season I smoked weed. There was a season I lived with my boyfriend, but I wasn't married. There was a season I had sex with my girlfriend before we got married. There was a season I let myself go. There was a season where I associated with the wrong people. There was a season where I had financial decisions that were not the best. If you've ever had a moment in your life where you have temporarily made some bad choices then you won't be able to relate to Rahab because when we study Rahab what we start to understand is that she was not bad I wish I had helpful people here she was not bad forever she was just bad for a season and we have to stop condemning and judging people because sometimes I encounter you in a bad season I told y'all that's the struggle I had with social media Social media would have you suggest that every season in every person's life is always the season where I'm winning, the season where I'm up, the season where everything is good. You better stop telling that lie because, see, sometimes the real reason you don't go on social media is not always because you fasting. It's because you're going through a season you don't want us to see. And sometimes we got to be honest about the fact that I've got some bad seasons. And I'm just trying to help somebody understand. Just hang on in there with me. This season won't last forever. I'm going to move out. I'm going to get myself together. I'm going to stop smoking weed. This is a season that's not good for the prostitute Rahab. And for those of us that don't understand it, we also will have moments where I'm just in a bad season. Y'all, can we be honest? Before I unpack this, y'all need to give me a minute. Y'all, the church is filled with folk who are no longer in that season. (laughs) And the reason some of y'all struggle with listening to certain people preach is because your context of them is in that other season. You don't want to hear their solo because that context of you have of them is in that other season. You don't want them leading a ministry because your context of them is in the other season. And what I'm trying to get you to say is that all of us have a Rahab in us. Where I was temporarily in a bad season. So let me introduce you to a woman by the name of Rahab. Rahab. This is a woman who is defined by her occupation. As a matter of fact, the truth be told, her job practically was her last name. Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot. You see, there were two kinds of prostitutes in this day. There were the religious ones. I so desperately want to put a pin in that. I so desperately want to preach about the modern day church prostitutes that don't sell their sex, but they sell their gift. They, they, they don't sell their body, but they sell their anointing. But I'm not going to do that. Y'all not going to tempt me to preach about church prostitutes. Oh, now, I'm not going to preach about the church prostitutes. I'm not going to preach about the religious prostitutes. You know, those preachers who say, I'll come for $1,000. Those musicians that say, I'll come, but you got to pay me. But, but no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not preaching about the religious prostitutes. I'm not preaching about the religious prostitutes. There were two kinds of prostitutes in this day. There were the religious one who worked at the Canaanite temple. And then there were the run-of-the-mill harlots who worked for cash. Rahab, I know there's babies here, but we got to stop, we got to stop acting like we don't live in the world we live in. Rahab was a whore. It's an ugly word, but that's what she was. She she was cursed into this lifestyle. She, 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 She may have been smart. She may have been resolute. 
but she was never called Rahab the brain. She may have had great grades in school, but she was never referred to as Rahab with the potential. She was a woman that was talked about and not to, especially not in public. She was a social outcast. She was an ostracized moral leper. She was tolerated but not honored. That's a great word for somebody. What a painful existence to be tolerated but not honored. To be tolerated but not really accepted. Even the men who beat a path to her door at night turned their backs on her by the light of day. As the whole all of Jericho turned their backs on her. And just parenthetically, let me insert this. Any relationship that is simply a relationship of the dark and can't be a relationship in the light is not a relationship that is honoring of God and that God expects you to be in. If you can only call me at 11 p.m. and you can't call me at 11 a.m., then we've got a problem. If we can only have a private meal, but we can't sit in public in a restaurant, we've got a problem. And this is a situation that Rahab finds herself in. Here's a woman, y'all, even that some versions of the Bible try to clean her up. And you'll see versions of the Bible that refer to her as an innkeeper. Uh, no, no, she, she wasn't an innkeeper. <laughs> this woman ran an establishment. It was situated in the city gates of Jericho. She served many men who were both locals and travelers. See, the difference between a prostitute and an innkeeper is that the innkeeper would, you would be able for the price of clean sheets. And you could go to an innkeeper and pay money and get clean sheets. But a prostitute, you would find a woman between the clean sheets. She was not an innkeeper. She did more than just offer food and lodging and amenities. You wasn't about calling the front desk just in case you left your toothbrush or your toothpaste at home. No, Rahab has a lowly vocation. She has no husband to provide for her. According to the text, she has a father and a mother and sisters and brothers. But there's no mention, I'm going to pull this pen out later, there's no mention of children right now in her story. Her family lived on another part of town knowing that her lifestyle brought shame to their family. We could call Rahab, just give me time to set her up, a paragon of otherness. She embodies the opposite of the traditional values that are held by Old Testament readers. She was female. She was Canaanite, which was Israel's mortal enemy. Uh, she was a, a prostitute. She was a resident of Jericho, which is significant because it's the first city doomed to fall by the sword when the Is Israelites enter the land. She's like, receive this, she's living like a death row inmate waiting for the needle. And there's some things we don't like to discuss about Rahab. Some things that we ought remember. One thing that we know about Rahab that we don't like to talk about is that like her or hate her, she knew how to handle men. She knew what they thought. She knew how they behaved. She knew what they needed. And we also know about Rahab is that according to the rabbinical tradition, she was one of the four most beautiful women in the ancient world. According to the rabbinical tradition, the four most beautiful women of that time were Sarah, Abigail, Esther, and Rahab. Business at Rahab's place was booming. This is for somebody. She was successful, but she was successful at the wrong things. How many of us? become successful at the wrong things? How many of us become proficient at the wrong things? It doesn't matter how good you are at the video game, brother, if your children need pampers and food. 
So oftentimes we are good at running ball and waxing our cars, but our marriages are falling apart. And we've got to be careful that if I'm going to be successful, I've got to be successful at the right things. Given these truths, we have a pressing question in the text. Stay close. It's going, it's going to matter where I'm going. The pressing question of the text is why are two Israelite spies at a harlot's doorstep. We don't like to drill down on the language of the, the language allusions of the text. But the text alludes to something that we don't like to talk about in Christianity. The language of the text suggests some shadiness of the actions of the spies. Let me go ahead and park here for a moment. If you a spy, why are you getting caught? I'm, I'm glad you asked. You, are, you got caught as a spy because you stayed long someplace you shouldn't have been to begin with. <laughs> Understand the language of the text. No, the language of the text. First of all, the spies lodge. Everybody say lodge. The spies lodge in Rahab's house. The word lodge is used in the Hebrew in both sexual and and non-sexual context is that the word literally means sleeping with I, it could be said that you sleep with your teddy bear or you sleep with your husband one has a sexual connotation and one does not so the writer of the Joshua specifically inserts language that suggests the spies are up to no good I'm not done. But not only that, the text says the king's men arrive and the writer uses the verb for enter and the preposition unto. The men entered unto. It is a double meaning in play, but it's even more blatant than the first illusion. Rahab's name functionally means broad, which means loose woman. So literally in the Hebrew, the text says you entered into a loose woman. And even though the text does not explicitly charge the spies with sexual sin, the writer seems to want our reader to accept the potential that they did. So before we move on, I need to consider a troubling question. Here's the troubling question. Did the Israelite spies feel they had sexual license with the women of Jericho because these women were about to die anyway? This is a great place to park. Because it says a lot about how we treat people that we see as desperate. I'm trying to liberate men and women in this sermon series. And oftentimes part of the reason as men, the reason why we can treat women so poorly is because we feel like they can't do better without us. And so we'll cheat and expect them to still love us. We will, we will, we will, we will, as long as I'm paying the bills, don't expect anything significant of me. And you can tell a whole lot about somebody based upon how we treat them when we see other people as desperate. This is a, this is a litmus test for us as Christians. This is one of my pet peeves for organizations that do ministry in our community. And this is why I will continue to champion the work of the Reach Center. I will continue to champion the work of Ripple Effects. I will continue to champion the work of the Boys and Girls Club. And the reason, and I might as well just go here, I will continue to champion the work where the executive directors and the boards look like people of color. And let me tell you why. Because it's one thing for me to help you. It's another thing for me to help you and leave you with no dignity. And at the end of the day, when we see desperate people around us, I can't treat them as nothing, as if I'm doing you a favor. And so here these men come into the city and they recognize you're going to die anyway, so I might as well sleep with you. You're going to die anyway, so I might as well abuse you. You're going to die anyway, so I might as well molest you. You're going to die anyway. And we've got to be careful about how we treat folk that we see as desperate. And I want to speak to somebody 
that is listening to me preach today. You spent your whole life with people mistreating you because you didn't necessarily have money or you didn't have the best opportunities or things didn't come your way. And I'm here to speak death to that experience and to say to somebody, you are worthy and you do deserve dignity and God does deserve to use you. And at the end of the day, we've got to be careful about how we treat folk that are desperate. See, it had already been decreed and declared in Deuteronomy chapter 20. I got Bible for y'all. It had already been declared in Deuteronomy chapter 20. It spells it out. He says very clearly in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave anything that breathes. In other words, kill everybody. And he lays out the cities. Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites. That's Jericho. The spies know that Rahab is a person under the ban. They know that Rahab is going to be slaughtered in combat in a few days. And, and y'all, I want y'all to see, I want you to grab, I want you to see what's going on here. They mistreat her because you're going to die anyway. She views her doom, her imminent death, as a reason she needs to be bolder than she's ever been before. And this is where there is a liberty and a lifting of somebody's head. Am I preaching to anybody that is a little bit desperate? And I believe the Lord is saying, if you're feeling like you have imminent death, if you feel like you are in a desperate situation, then this is what the Lord is saying to you today. This is a season where I want you bolder than you've ever been before. Somebody type that in bolder than I ever been before. Why are you talking to me like that? Because I don't want to die in this condition. Why are you treating me like that? Because I don't want to die like this. How come you're trying what you're trying? Because I don't want to die in this situation. How come you're risking your family and you're risking yourself? Because I don't want to die. And I'm here to tell somebody, your future is linked to your boldness right now. I wish I had a handful of people that could help me. Somebody type in, I'm too desperate to be quiet. I'm too desperate to shut up. I'm too desperate. I'm too desperate not to try something new. I'm going to do everything I need to do because I am doomed if I don't. And at this point, I'm almost at my first point. At this point, Rahab shines as the hero. Watch this. Who has outsmarted everybody else in the story. She's hidden the spies. She's detected by the king's men. The king's men come to her. She sends them on a fool's errand. She said, well, you know, yeah, they, they were here. You know, they were here. You know, why, why did the king's men know where they were? I'm glad you asked. Because they didn't look like they were locals. So they were easy to spot. And the, and the language ends with Rahab joining the spies where she has concealed them, which is on the roof. And before they go to sleep, she has something to say. And what she articulates astounds us as a reader. She begins with this declaration in verse number nine. And she begins with this declaration and says, I know the Lord is handing this land over to you. In other words, Rahab believes that she and her people will indeed die. But she knows that God intends to give her homeland to the Israelites. And everybody is in terror. Rahab then forms a sentence that must disorient the spies. This is what she says. The Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Wait, 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 wait. The prostitute has now introduced theological language. <laughs> she has confessed belief in Yahweh. Yo, can you imagine the expressions on the spies' faces where this prostitute, Rahab, is now articulating orthodox Israelite theology? Whether or not they came to her for sex, her declaration has to shock them. And as a result, 
the story teaches us how this former prostitute goes from shame to fame. Today, as I unpack this text, I want to teach everyone who is listening how we move from shame to fame. There are four things that she teaches us. The first thing that she teaches us is the reality. Everyone say the reality. Type that in. The reality of poor beginnings. (laughs) She lives in Jericho. Let me help you understand Jericho. In Jericho, they practice witchcraft. In Jericho, they specialize in sexual immorality. In Jericho, they believe in child sacrifice. Y'all not ready for where I'm going. In Jericho, they practice idolatry. Let me say it one more time. Witchcraft, idolatry, sexual immorality, and child sacrifice. Here it goes, Eric. And that was just the religious people. The two spies had any notion at all that they would find someone in Jericho as sympathetic to their cause as Rahab. Let me park here for a moment. We have to be careful of how we judge people that come from worse backgrounds than we do. I might as well just, I'm going to park here, I'm going to minister this word for a few moments. You better be careful of judging people that are not yet practicing Christians. And you want to know, well, how in the world could you not have received Christ? You don't know what background they came from. You don't know what neighborhood they came from. You don't know what some of us, we need to be honest about this. One big reason why many of us are saved is because we were blessed to be born in a Christian nation. But had we been born in a third world country, had we been born in a nation where they don't even make a Bible in our language, we may not be as spiritually grounded as we are right now. And we've got to be careful of judging people that come from poor backgrounds. You don't know what your life would look like had you come from where other people have come from. And I want to take a moment right now and begin praising God for where I've come from. Because God, I had to pour. It was already rough what my background was. But God, it could have been worse. Somebody type in. It could have been worse. And we have to understand, y'all. We see now. Oh, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. We see the evidences of this. When you come from poor backgrounds and you have the reality of poor beginnings, it shows up in poorly funded and low quality schools. You think your child is just smarter than everybody else's? Maybe your child had opportunity other children didn't have. The reason why we judge folk, we judge childhood obesity in certain communities. But but if, if everybody outside the house is shooting, See, I'm about, I'm about fed up to hear what folks talking about when well, in my generation we went out the side and played. In your generation, they weren't shooting up the neighborhood. And at some, at some point, we've got to recognize that we are the byproduct of our backgrounds. And it's easy to judge a woman who makes her money prostituting, but that's all she knew. That was the example she had. That's what folk did in her hood. They sold drugs. They shot up. They spread their legs for a living. That's what they did. But here you go. You third generation college. You pulled yourself all up and you want to look down at other people because they're not where you had. Well, I'm sorry, darling. My parents didn't pay for my college. I'm sorry. I didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth. I'm sorry. Everything didn't go my way from day one. There's the reality of poor beginnings for some folk. And we got to be careful. You don't know had you you used. I don't know how in the world you would sell your body to eat. You just never been hungry. I'm not here to I'm not here to sensationalize. I'm not here to say okay to sin. That's not the sermon. I'm trying to teach those of us who have not had that reality to stop being so condemning and judgmental of people that had a poorer beginning than I had. Environmental hazard. Lead poisoning impacts brain behavior. Right now in our communities, 
There are infants being born in homes with rooms with leaded paint. And you wonder why they struggle with their early childhood brain development. It's not because they're stupid. It's not because they can't learn. It's because they had a poorer beginning than you had. And this interfered with their ability to have the kind of life you're used to. Lack of playgrounds. Go to a nice community in Cary. Fuquay Barina. Wake Forest. You want to help them folk? They always, I, I went through that neighborhood. They were out there pushing their babies. They were out there riding their bikes. They were out there running. Let me help you for a moment. They have something we don't have. Sidewalks. We, we, we have to recognize the reality of poor beginnings. Y'all, 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 y'all. This woman is living in an unlikelihood of salvation. She has been birthed and nurtured in an environment of an unlikelihood of significance. And have you ever known people? We have known people. This is so convicting for me. I hope it is for you. We know people that we honestly have thought were too sinful for salvation. Your your background your appearance, your history, your reputation. And I'm here to release somebody in salvation right now. You're saying, Pastor, that's me. I can't come to your church because, Pastor, you don't understand. You got folk leading in your church that used to pay to have sex with me. Pastor, you, I can't come there because there's folk singing that I gave a lap dance to. And I'm scared that if I walk down the aisle, all they're going to see me is for what I used to be. And they're not going to be able to embrace me. God, Pastor, I can't do it. Because you you have mothers in church that have buried sons over drug use that I sold them the drugs. I can't come to the church, Pastor. I can't do that because if I come, they're going to recognize. They're going to see when I cross my leg in the pew and at the seat, they're going to see my monitor on and they're going to know that I'm somebody that's marked. I can't come. And I'm speaking to you. And this is what God is saying. If you think for a moment you are not good enough, you are right, but you are bad enough. If you think for a word moment you're not worthy enough, you're right, but you're unworthy enough. If you think for a moment you are not likely enough, you're right, but you're not unlikely enough. There is no person that is so unlikely and so unworthy and so bad that God can't save you. The church has spiritual medicine. It's not healthy folk who need a doctor. It's sick folk. Yo, if I don't have any spiritual needs, I don't need salvation. I don't need the church. And if I'm going to come to realize that I'm a sinner who has rebelled against God and broken his law, that I deserve condemnation and judgment, then the Bible has good news for me. It's called grace. Can somebody type in grace? Come on, somebody shout out grace. I want you to understand this. Let me give you this point before I give you my second point. Temporary sin does not imply permanent condemnation. Temporary sin does not imply permanent condemnation. I want you to hear this. God can deliver you despite the death and despite the duration of your depravity. Regardless of how deep you've been in it and regardless of how long you've been in it, you can you've been in it. God can save. God can deliver you from the deepest hole. He can deliver you from the hole of depression. He can deliver you from the hole of suicidal thoughts. He can deliver you out of any hole. Don't let your life be thrown away simply because you experience the reality of poor beginnings. You can move from shame to fame when you understand the reality of poor beginnings. There's a second thing this text teaches are y'all with me? Are you with me? Type in, I'm with you. Shout out, I'm with you, Pastor. I know y'all. I know this is a little raw for some of y'all. It's the, it's, it is what it is. It's 
a fresh look. I can't. How you want me to PG-13 a prostitute story? It's the reality, number one, of poor beginnings. And I hope you're I'm moving on. I want you to receive it. Regardless of how poor your beginning was, there is hope for you. <laughs> Second point is not only the reality of poor beginnings, but number two, there is the retention of possibility and hope. There is the retention of possibility and hope. Y'all, this is really, really important. I need my media people to keep up with me on my slides because I want to preach this well and I need to see what I need to see. There's the retention of possibility and hope. I think there is something we miss in the text. Keisha, this is really important. It's important for anybody that's running a nonprofit, anybody who has a dream, anybody that has a hope, anybody that has this vision in their life. It's something we miss in the text. And so what we miss in the text is how well prepared Rahab is when the opportunity of deliverance presents itself. <laughs> I'm preaching better than y'all typing amen, but that's all right. Let me help y'all for a moment. When these men show up, we already have evidence that she has studied and learned and heard about Yahweh. We already have evidence that she knows what he's able to do. We already have evidence that she's been thinking about. Oh, no, oh, notice what happens. She does not, when the men show up, take a step back and say, wow, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This might be my shot. What should I do? No, 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 no. I believe when I look at her story, when I look at her response, even though she had poor beginnings, she was retaining something. There was something sitting in her that says, I know I started wrong, but I can get better. I just know. I just can't believe God is going to leave me like this. I can't believe. Do I have anybody that can look back over your life? And even though folk have counted you out and folk didn't act like you were made of anything, you kept holding on to some hope. You kept saying, maybe there's a possibility that God can use me. Maybe there's a chance my marriage can be saved. Maybe there's a moment that things don't have to look like this. She's holding on. She's retaining possibility and hope and I'm going to speak this over somebody's life you better get ready for God's grace to show up at your doorstep and when God somebody type that in his grace at my doorstep and see when his grace is at your doorstep that ain't the time to figure out what you're going to say that's not the time to give your ask that's not the time no when the grace shows up at your doorstep you better be ready pastor where is it in the text verse number four she knew to hide them. Verse number four. She already had a well-constructed lie ready. I, I, I love this. She didn't lie all the way. She lied enough for them to believe the lie. Because had she said, I don't know what you're talking about, they would have knew she was lying. She said, you're right. They were here. You know what I do for a living. They were here. But, you know, I didn't know where they were from. And so, you know, I, they left going that way. And if I were you, that's where I go. She already had her story ready. She sends the king's troops in another direction. Verse 5. Verse 6. She has a hiding place for the spies. Verses 9 through 11, y'all, watch this. She has her speech ready. She starts saying to them, I know the Lord God has given you land. She says, hold up, hold up. Hold, 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 hold my married brothers. You can appreciate this. Literally, she's saying to the brothers, look, before y'all go to sleep, we need to talk. Now, you know, brother's not trying to talk. He's like, we didn't come here to talk. She said, no, no, you're going to listen to me. So before you go to sleep, we're going to talk. She goes up and hides them amongst the brush of the flax. As she hides them amongst it, she gives them a speech. She says, I know the Lord has given you the land. I heard what the Lord did at the Red Sea. I heard what the Lord did for the Amorite kings, how he destroyed Sihon and Og. And this is what she says. I know the Lord is God. She already, and then watch this, verse 12, she says, so this is what I'm asking for. The same way I saved your behind. I need you to save my mother and my father and my family, and I need you to deliver our lives. 
and I'm just here to speak this to somebody. God is about to send somebody to your doorstep. And when he sends somebody to your doorstep, don't be stuttering. Don't be scratching your head talking about, I don't know what I want. Don't be scratching your head talking about, I don't know what's next. You better be ready. Hold on to a possibility and a hope. She's been waiting for somebody to rescue her. This is in my spirit. I believe there are people all through our community that's waiting for somebody to rescue them. They're waiting for somebody to ring the doorbell. They're waiting for somebody to knock on the door. What then, though, is the basis of the possibility and the hope? What does she's basis on? It's the same thing we should base our retention of possibility and hope on. She bases it on, watch this, the past victories of the Lord. She says it very clearly. I know the Lord giving you the land. And I know that and it's because of that a great fear fell upon us. And, and everybody who lived in the country, we're melting in fear because of you. Y'all, they had such a great victory in the past that it spread to the city of Jericho and to their enemies. Chop this down in your notes. Look at the victories of my past. You're saying, but pastor, I started from a bad beginning. You already told me that at the beginning of the sermon. But look at the victories of your past. You're still alive. Come on, you still have your right mind. Do I have a handful of people that are listening to me preach, that are watching this broadcast, that can type in some of the victories of your past? And the reason why I'm confident that God is going to do something great in my life tomorrow is because God did something great in my life yesterday. Do I have any folk? I'm sorry, y'all. I just feel a little bit of preaching. Is there anybody here that can look back over your life and say the same God that healed me before is the same God? Somebody shout the same God. The same God that can heal me now. Look past your victories. We are to remember. Jot this down. Two words. Remember and rejoice. Oh, good Lord. If we were in in person worship right now, the organ would be going and y'all would be running around the room and laying at the altar. I'm going to type it in one more time. Say it one more time. Remember and rejoice. Come on now. Make it personal. One more time. Remember. And rejoice. This is what I'm getting. That's all I'm saying. When you remember what God has done in your past, all you can do is rejoice. When I think of the goodness of the Lord and all that he's done for me, my soul shouts out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As I look back over my life and I think things over, all I can truly say is that I am blessed. I have a somebody shout. I have a testimony. It's based upon the victories of the past. You look backward because you want to build on the victories of the past. And I want us to understand, y'all, this is where we are as a church. Some people can't understand this. Do you know how many victories we've had since 2005? I'm going to say it again. Think about how far we've come since 2005. And you really expect me to think God is done? I'm sorry. When I look back and remember, I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to trust about what he's about to do. Because when I notice how he's made a way out of no way before, somebody shout, he'll do it again. He says, the Lord, and this is what I want you to get what she says. She says, I want you to, he says, in essence, she's saying to us, remember the victories and we want to rejoice in them. And this is what she's saying. The Lord has surely, she says it, given the whole land into your hands. This is very important. Unless you have all of it now, God is not done. Somebody shout, he's not done. He's not done. So no, if you want me to slow down and stop, no, I won't because he's not done. He's not given the whole land into our hands yet. This text is teaching us you move from shame to fame with the reality of poor beginnings, with the retention of possibility and hope. Number three, I move from shame to fame with resolve in my personal choices. She, she's making up in her mind, I'm not going to die less than. I love this about her. She is remembered not for harlotry, but for bravery. <laughs> I want to talk to somebody who's had a rough spot in your life. I'm here to prophesy over your life. That's not how you're going to be remembered. You're not going to be remembered as a single mom. You're not going to be remembered 
Come on, you're not going to be remembered as somebody that got arrested for smoking weed. You're not going to be remembered for the poor choices in your life. I want you to understand this is going to make somebody shout. Rahab is not remembered for loving men. She's remembered for trusting God. Because watch what happens. Jot this down. My personal choices activate God's grace. Wow. I want to say this to somebody. It's about time you share with one other person. I'm not telling you to come to the media department and record your testimony. I'm not telling you to do that because I want to be honest. Not everybody can handle the Rahab in you. Let me be very clear about that. This is what I want you to understand, though. When you begin to be when you're beginning to be honest about shame in your past. It does not bind you. It frees you. See, some of you, you don't want to you, you, you have the divorce lingering over you, so you don't want to sing. You, you, you have the fact that you were t- teenage mom hanging over you, so you don't think you're qualified to lead ministry. You have an unbelievable gift, but you know you had that hiccup before. And what I would encourage you to do is set yourself free. Be honest about it. Not that you're sensationalizing it. Not that you're saying it's good. But you're saying, I'm, what, what, watch this, Lord. It was binding me when I was doing it. I'm not going to let it keep binding me now that I've been delivered from it. And at some point, I got, I'm going to let every sin in my life know. You had me hostage long enough, but today is my day of liberty. Today is my day of freedom. Today is my day when I'm moving on to be who God has called me to be. The Lord is saying this is the moment where it's about choices. I'm almost done. For someone listening to me. The Lord is saying, I want you to get that. I'm going to say one more thing, though. I'm going to say one more thing. He makes a deal with them, Eric. I, man, this word is so good. I love the Bible. I just love the Bible. Now, now I, didn't, I didn't have a chance to read this. But, but, but this, is what, this is what the spy said. He says, now listen. Here's the deal. Now, this is why I know, this is why I know that, that you know, they were there for no, no good reason. Verse 14, the men said, okay, our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours. Now, now, see, I need you to understand something. She has already sent the king's troops elsewhere. They are already hiding. What is there for her to tell? Somebody needs to hear this. God is saying the reason you don't have the fullness in your life is you cannot resist telling people's business. Somebody type in, stay out of my business. Now keep no tight. Don't, don't just uh, stay out of my business so you can live. Stay out of my business so you'll have a life. Stay out of my business so God can use you. This is what he says. See, I want y'all to get this. The salvation of her whole family is based on her ability to mind her business. I'm almost done. It's the reality of poor beginnings. It's the retention of possibility and hope. It's a resolve in my personal choices. Here's the last thing. And the last thing of moving from shame to fame is the redemption from a powerful God. Verse 18. Verse number 18. I didn't read it, but it says, when we come into the land, You shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down and you shall gather into your house your father and mother and brothers and all your household. But if anyone goes out the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head. 
and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. Now, this is something I want you to see. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, y'all. Her salvation and the salvation of her family is going to be is required that she hangs out the same scarlet rope that they climb down on that is placed as a symbol. So when they come in to destroy the land, that house is not destroyed. Now, I want you to understand something. This is this is this is. This is risky. Because now everyone is understanding and knows she's a prostitute. So when they come in to destroy the land, it's a reason this rope is on this house. Now this is what God is saying to somebody. You are going to have to determine and decide to have a public association with God in order for your life to get better. This is not just, this is what he's saying. All that profession of faith you made, all you talking about Yahweh, give me an association that everybody can see. Let everybody see this scarlet cord, this scarlet, this scarlet cord on your house. And some of y'all insist on being saved and insist on claiming love of God, but you don't want to associate publicly with the people of God. And so I'm talking to people that don't have a church home. Rahab, when she hangs the scarlet cord out her window, exactly as the spies command her, she marks herself as a prostitute, not only for the two who come for her, but for all the Israelites, including Joshua himself. She didn't initially blend in. She stood out, but they embraced her. And you won't blend in day one at Word Tabernacle, but we'll embrace you. No, it's going to be a while before you figure out the dress code. It's going to be a while before you learn culture. It's going to be a while before you know the church language. It's going to be a while before you know everybody's name. But I get you. Until you blend in, we're going to accept you. And to the credit of God's people, they embraced her. She was not afraid to wave her flag and say, here I am. She was to mark her house with a scarlet cord and then gather herself and all her family into it. And then on the day of the attack, all of those who were inside the house would be spared. If any of them wandered outside the house, they would be destroyed. You missed it. Because I'm preaching long, so you missed it. As long as you in the house, you safe. <laughs> Some of you you wondering why I'm having such a rough spot because you wandered outside the house. I'm wondering how come things not good on my job because I wandered outside the house. I wonder why the enemy's going after me like he did because I wandered outside the house. And if you think church membership is not important, it is always safer in the house than outside the house. <sighs> I wonder where they got the idea from anyway. I think they got the idea possibly rooted in their own experience with the Passover 40 years earlier. That God told the Israelites in Egypt to mark their houses with scarlet, the blood of a lamb, and enter into them. Y'all, there is a location for salvation. And it's in Jesus. I'm done. It's the reality of poor beginning. It's the retention of possibility of hope. It's the resolve of my personal choices. And it's a redemption from a powerful God. I know what you're thinking, Pastor. You, you short. You short, Pastor. Where's the fame? I, I, I get that she's no longer in shame, but where's the fame? I'm so glad you asked. In chapter 6, we're told that Rahab is living to this day, up to that day, among the Israelites. Now, that's important because initially she was on the fringes of the community. Initially, she was not part of one of them. She was an outsider, not an insider. And, and then we know from Matthew's gospel... <laughs> She wound up having a baby. It, I, don't, I don't think she had one here in Joshua 2 because when she references everybody to be saved, if you are mama, your child will be first on the list. She says, my mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters, and my family. No reference. But y'all, this woman now 
marries this harlot, this, this prostitute. That she marries, and and she 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 winds up marrying, and her and her husband have a baby, and his name is Boaz. And this woman, Rahab, is the great, great grandmother of King David. And she gets listed in the genealogy of Jesus. God moves her from shame. Come on, somebody shout it out to fame. Yo, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to close. Um. Without her obedience, hers would be a story of ethnic cleansing. None would have lived. But because of her faith, because of her confession, because of her story, she is proof that even the most likely, the most unlikely, if we believe, we can be saved. Say amen if you can. I want to pray for you, man. I, I want to pray. I want to pray hard. I want to pray real. I want to, I want to pray this sermon over your life. You're watching. You're listening without a personal relationship with the Lord. Without a church home where you're growing and serving. This is the moment you have to make that decision. This is the moment. This is the moment of a new beginning. This is the moment where you accept and through your belief, God does great things. So come on, let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for the starts and the stops in our life. I thank you, God, for endings and beginnings. And I'm speaking over your people that we will now enter into a place of no more fears. No more dwelling on past mistakes. No more reliving the worst things I've done. No more doubting the paths I've been placed on. No more speaking. God, I'm speaking right now to every emotional trauma. I'm speaking right now, God, to the emotional traumas that have been caused by my old life. And God, if this woman, Rahab, can wind up giving birth to a Boaz and wind up in the genealogy of Jesus, then clearly, God, you can move me from shame to fame. And so, God, I'm speaking to people with emotional trauma that's been caused by mistakes in their past. I'm speaking to the spirit of depression. I'm speaking to people who have flashbacks and can't shake what happened in their past. I'm speaking, God, and cursing post-traumatic stress, sleep disorders, panic attacks, suicidal thoughts, substance abuse, self-harm. And I'm praying right now, God, by your spirit, that you would release healing, that you would release confidence, that you would release inspiration, that you would release hopefulness, that there would be a spirit of boldness, a spirit of contentment, that you would release enthusiasm and freedom and momentum and optimism and wholeness and worthiness and triumph and passion. I'm praying right now, God, that there is a movement. God, let there be a movement, God, from shame to fame. And as I speak to our congregation, that person who has the reality of a poor beginning, God, they're going to overcome it. God, help me to retain every possibility. Help me to retain my hope. Help me, God, to resolve in my personal choices that I'm going to get through this. And I'm looking forward, God, to the redemption that only you can offer. And so, God, we lift up, God, your name this moment. I pray, God, for people that are making decisions. I pray you would give them the confidence of those decisions. I pray they'll say, man, I want to be in the church. I pray for people that have left that'll say, you know what? I recognize their safety in the house. I pray for somebody that's scared. They're nervous. They're fearful that they're not going to be really God. They're not going to blend in right away. But God, help them be confident. We are going to accept you. you. You may not even have a permanent address because you may be homeless. We're going to accept you. You, you may not have a clean, a fresh change of clothes. Even clean clothes, we're going to accept you. We're going to help you. We, we, we may very well be the very ones that God has sent to your doorstep 
to offer God's grace. So God, I'm praying, God, now as decisions are being made, help us now, God, to worship you at this moment. Come on, y'all, lift that song up. Just worship together. We bless your name, God. We bless your name, God. Come on, this is the moment God is going to change your life. Come on, while they're singing this, type in, I want to be saved. Say, I want to join the church. Type in your prayer request. We want all of your prayer requests. Thank you, God. This is that moment where you do that. Surrender yourself. I'm telling you, he's going to do great things in your life. Despite your past, he's going to do great things in your life. Thank you, God. Come on, this message has helped you. Can you clap your hands? Can you clap your hands? Can you type in, come on, some type of emoji? Everybody shout this with me. Type this in with me. Reality of poor beginnings. Retain my hope. Resolve in my decisions. Redemption from God. I'm telling you, he can move you from shame to fame. Before we go home, I want to pray over the offering and, and, and close in prayer. I want you to hear my heart. Don't, don't log off without the benediction. If we were in church right now, I would tell the greeters, don't let nobody, don't let them out the door. Just keep, stay right in here till we're done. We're not here. It's not that long. It's not that long. Um, I want to say a couple things real quick. The COVID um, uh, virus rates are increasing in our community. Edgecombe County is back in red after the whole state being out of red. Edgecombe County was the first county to go back to red. It's anticipating that every county around Nash, Edgecombe, Wilson, Halifax, Northampton, all will also probably go red. Um, lots of us have been vaccinated, but only 20% have been. And I'm not here to fight that fight right now. I'm gonna, we're going to have an event with the AKAs on Saturday where we're going to talk about hesitancy and all of that. And I, I'm not a medical doctor. I've never played one. Don't fake like I'm, I'm one. I'm a pastor. And this is what I know. What I know is, I was watching a basketball game last night. They talked about a 23-year-old professional athlete. Now, if you know what your body felt like at 23, it feels a lot different at 23 than it does 53 or 43. 23-year-old professional athlete, never been sick, no comorbidities, got COVID on my birthday, January 9th. In order for him to play, he has to use an inhaler. Because he can barely breathe. And this is the point I'm making. In a little while, I'm going to bury a beloved member of our church. I got, the, I got the shot, the Johnson Johnson shot. Some people got Pfizer. Some people got, got um, uh, Moderna, Moderna, Moderna. All of them have side effects. All the side effects are temporary. COVID is permanent. And let me say this. There's nothing more permanent than death. And so I don't want to bury you. I don't want to bury you. Um, not now. Okay, let me say that. And so I'm asking you to be prayerful. I want to bring our church back. I want us to bring us back safely. And so would you really be prayerful about the vaccine? Would you be prayerful about the long-term implications of not getting it and the long-term implications of contracting the disease or the virus and what could happen? Um, and that's all I got for that. And then the last thing is, thank you for your giving. Yes. We're in the midst of God doing something great. Most of you are deciding to be a part of it. I want to ask you just to dig deep. We're working very, very hard here at the church. Um, I want to, I want to just love on the staff. This is a lot of work. This is hard work. Um, this week alone, we have four funerals. 
Um, and so all the work is going on. The church is busy. The building is busy. We're trying to get it ready for you to come back. Um, and if you would help us in your giving and just stay faithful in that space while we accomplish this work, it's going to mean so much. You're getting a letter from me at the end of this week in your home mail, mailboxes. We'll talk about why we're making the decisions we're making around the building, around returning, around the significance of our um, standing on the word together. And you're going to see all of that. So be on the lookout for that. So I want to pray over our offering, pray over you. Thank you for worshiping today. I hope you'll share this video uh, with some friends. Let's pray. God, we love you and we honor you. And we thank you for every member, every partner. I thank you for the people around the country that are saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to partner with Word Tabernacle Church. Thank you for the faithfulness of our members. Thank you for the offering that's going forth now, whether we're driving by the church, whether we are giving on Cash App or ACS or text giving, or we're mailing checks in. I pray that you would use all of it for the building of your kingdom, the spread of your word, and the glorifying of your name. It's in the strong name of Jesus we pray. And God's people said, amen.